So it's, um, it's three minutes after. I think there'll be a few more people joining, but I want to respect people's time. So um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, just, um, I don't know what is showing on everyone else's screen, but if you want captioning, there is, uh, you can just hit the live transcript. I think I have it just set up so it's captioning for everyone. Um, so I think I, I know most of you, or if not all of you, I'm the executive director of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. We're a statewide social justice oriented disability rights organization. And um, I'm I think most of you know that I have had the privilege for about 10 years of serving on the uh, Legal Services Corporation Board and as a client uh, representative. And part of that is I get to go to this conference every year um, from the National um, Legal Aid and Defenders Association. And we it's always a really cool conference. And this year I went to, the I think like one of the best workshops I've ever been to in my life. And, um, and it was all on power building and community organizing. And so I, the whole time I was there, I was just thinking, I want this in Colorado. This is exactly what we need. It's, I can see kind of what, where we need to go next as a community. Um, and it was presented in a way that was so engaging, you know, even, you know, a virtual conference is kind of hard, but it, at the end, I'm like, wait a minute, there isn't more time. Usually you're like ready to get off. So, yeah. um, Initially, I was thinking about um, state meeting, and then it's like, no, we can't wait. We need to do it. So I stopped Charlie, who is a presenter and founder, and said, can you, can you virtually come to Colorado? Um, so Charlie Cooksey is our presenter, and she is um, the founder and, and CEO of We Power St. Louis. And what she's done in St. Louis, it's like exactly what we want to do on our issues. So they're, um, and she'll talk about it, but basically their issue was lack of early childhood education with the population that they were working with. And same kinds of stuff that we deal with, you know, if like people were like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a crumb, you know, um, but not really dealing with the systemic change. And then of course, wanting the experts to run things, not the parents who actually know their kids. And so the, or the organizing that they've done basically is they organized a ton of parents, did the hard work and to create a, a childhood, a early childhood program that is that where the parents are in control and running things. And in the process created this whole power building academy um, was so that not only did they get the program, but they got the oversight and policy stuff um, that, that, you know, that we always deal with. And we've always been good at getting policies, but then the system finds a loophole and then we have to get another one. So what Charlie's going to present about is really a way to look at things differently that's a lot more holistic and long lasting. Um, so with that, I and so um, Charlie, I'll just kind of tell you who's who's here. It's um, basically it's uh, some, some staff from a number of advocacy organizations, a lot of volunteer advocates. Um, some um, I'll recognize Brenda Mosby, who's the co-chair of the CCDC Board of Directors. Um, but we have, um, but all people that are involved in disability social change work. Um, we have folks from all over the state. Um, glad to see Dave who, who when I, when I put out the email about interpreters, he asked if we had an interpreter for grumpy old guys from Cortez. Um, <laughs> but so we have people, you know, some of, some of our folks here are, um, you know, like Dave was probably eight hours away from Denver. Um, we have, so we have rural, urban um, folks. Some, some advocates here are fairly new. Some have been with us for decades. So it's a, it's a mix of people and there's still people joining, but we're gonna get going. So with that, um, and I will apologize ahead of time. I got so excited to set this up that I forgot that I teach Friday afternoons. So um, I, I have to jump off at three, but I've gotten to hear this already and Jose will be around to manage anything, Jose and Kenny. Um, so I would like to um, turn it over to Charlie to take it away. Is this being videotaped by the way, Julie? Uh, it's being recorded, yes. Recorded, I mean, that video. Okay. Yeah. Great, yeah. Hi, everyone. Can you um, hear me? Maybe see me? Yeah. Feel my presence? Yes. Yes, uh, we can hear you. 
Well, it's so great to be with you all today. Um, uh, on normal conditions uh, or circumstances, I would be saying Happy New Year, Happy 2021. Um, however, I know that uh, the current state of our our world right now um, isn't one that that uh, makes the conditions easy for us to be happy, but I think is one that uh, reminds us that we have to keep fighting and pushing and uh, engaging in collective action. So um, I don't know how to how to greet you on this January, but I do know that I'm grateful <laughs> to be here with you. Um, and uh, I'm so excited to, to have this conversation with you and, and grateful that Julie invited me. Um, so uh, as Julie titled it, this session is called Power Building for the 21st Century. And I will be sharing a few things, but it really will be a lot about uh, you all engaging in discussion together as folks on the ground in Colorado um, and who are most proximate to the, the disability injustice that is happening in your communities. Um, so we'll just start off with uh, who is in the room. So we'll do a Zoom, I mean, a poll everywhere exercise where you can uh, share one word to describe how you're feeling. I'll ask a few other questions. So we'll transition into that just so we can uh, break the ice a little. Um, so uh, if you've heard a poll everywhere, there's a few ways you can engage with it. Um, you can uh, text um, the, the uh, number 22333 and uh, send STL005. Uh, to that phone number, or you can go to this website right here, um, pollev.com forward slash STL005. So I'll put this in the chat um, and that will get us started. So text the number 22333 and say STL005, or you can go to pollev.com forward slash STL 005. Um, or you can just drop your comments in the chat. And if you want, you can shout them out. Um, all right, so Julie's testing it out for us. So the first question is one word to describe how you are entering this space. One word basically to describe how you feel as you are entering this space. Mad, glad, indifferent, angry, Excited, curious, anxious, ready, grumpy. David said grumpy. Intrigued, curious, anxious, calm. Ooh, that's a good one. I don't see calm often. I like that. Hungry, bah, sorry about that. Um, interested, hopeful. Hopeful's good. Um, what else do I see? Ready? All right. You can feel free to keep sharing. I'm going to transition us to the next uh, question. If I can get these slides together. All right. Well, I know or I believe you all are in Colorado. Um, I actually, my aunt, um, my grandma's only sister, uh, lived in Palm Springs uh, more than my entire, I'm 34 and she was like 95 when she passed away. So she lived there for years. Uh, so just curious, what community are you coming from, zooming in from today? It can be a neighborhood, it can be a city, it could be the global arena, whatever you wanna say, zip codes, Denver, Westminster, Aurora. I know Aurora, I know Denver. Um, Lamarco, Cole, uh, Lamar, uh, 81052. Lamar, Colorado. Sorry, I put them together. Oh, okay, okay. Got it, got it. All right, Adams, work in Adams, North Metro, and live in Jeffco, Cannon City, Colorado, all parts of Colorado. Pablo. All right, well, we have a, a nice mix of folks in the room, so thank you all for being here, Adams. All right. I must protest. That is Pueblo, not Pueblo. Pueblo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. And then what are your preferred 
uh, pronouns. She, her, hers, they, them, he, him, his, Z, or none and above. You will not be defined or you have a, a, another way you prefer to, to identify. A lot of she, her, hers in the room. Grandpa. All right. A few he, him, his. A growing list. Okay, let's move on. So the next question. I am comfortable talking about race, disability, class, privilege, oppression. A is true, B is false. Yes. Yes, 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 true. All right, so we're good. We're ready to get into it. Um, thank you all for sharing. So before we get too deep, uh, I have one more question. Oops. What's your favorite dessert? I know that I have been eating um, a lot of desserts since this pandemic has started um, and uh, probably should slow down, but curious, what is your favorite dessert, especially uh, over the past year? Oreos, cheesecake, popcorn, Ooh, ginger snaps. I used to love ginger snaps. I've had, I haven't had any in a long time. Carrot cake, ice cream, pumpkin pie, cream, cheesecake. Uh, this is the quickest list. This is the most active list, I feel like. <laughs> um, all right. Grapes. Oh, that's a healthy one. I've never thought about grapes as a dessert. As a dessert. Maybe I should. Empanadas. All right. So now that um, we've gotten that set and clear on the table, we'll get started. So just a little bit about my story. Um, this was a few years ago uh, after I, I chopped most of my hair off. Um, but my name is Charlie. I'm a St. Louis native, born and raised. Uh, and still live here in my hometown. Uh, I went off to a, a historically black college and university called Prairie View A&M University, right outside of Houston, Texas for college. Uh, and I went there to study political science uh, and to play tennis, but got really involved in grassroots activism and electoral justice and really making sure that the black and brown students uh, and families in my uh, city and uh, who attended the university had uh, rights uh, and that they could exercise their right to vote. Um, and I just knew I was going to go to law school. I had that as a goal since middle school. Uh, I had been preparing for the, the LSAT and they got a call from a program called Teach for America. And after 15 minutes, they said, um, uh, something magical enough for me to say, let's forget law school for two years. Uh, so I um, uh, wanted to go to all the cool cities, New York, LA, DC, and my mom begged me to put St. Louis down. Uh, so I put it down at the very bottom of the list. And of course, I got placed back home uh, in St. Louis for uh, my uh, location where I would teach uh, middle school English. Came back to St. Louis and I thought I could change the world one kid at a time, and I was rudely awakened to the fact that uh, the world is not that simple um, and that um, there are so many conditions in place uh, that hinder uh, school systems from thriving and that are barriers from our, our very brilliant students realizing their fullest potential. And so with that, I started an education nonprofit um, and said, all right, this is my next big key to solve education uh, and uh, support its middle school students with getting into the best college prep high schools, uh, completing high school and going on to college. Um, and then Mike Brown was murdered. Uh, he was murdered the same summer uh, that my uh, first group of students 
uh, had just graduated from uh, high school. And so I was feeling great and proud about our students and the work that we accomplished. And then boom, slapped in the face like the rest of uh, not just the country, but the world. And it caused me to question, what does it mean to get a quality education um, if a, a young black male can't even live past uh, his high school graduation? And so that made me really think about um, the policies that are in place that um, that are hindering uh, uh, black kids in particular in St. Louis, uh, brown kids across the country um, from thriving. And so I said, all right, I'm gonna focus on the policies. We've gotta shift these policies. And then I realized that it's not just about policy, it's about power. Um, we have to really think about who holds power and how that power is used to shift policies because often the policies and laws that are set are controlled by folks in power. Um, so that's my journey and it led me to starting We Power. Uh, so we're uh, a little over two and a half years old and uh, we've been on the ground working as hard as we can here in St. Louis, uh, trying to create a world where all black and brown and all black and Latinx uh, families and communities thrive. So that's my story and I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Uh, I wanted to ground us in a few agreements uh, that I got from a partner here in St. Louis so that we can have a productive and, uh, and uh, courageous time together. Um, so uh, the first one is I voice, um, speak your truth. So basically when we are sharing our thoughts, when we're sharing our stories, it will be important that we use I statements versus like we or they or them. Um, so really speaking from our own experiences and not trying to speak for others. The other agreement is listen to understand. So that means uh, receiving what others say, whether we agree with it or not, listening not to respond or rebuttal, but listening to process and to uh, be open to new ideas and concepts are to be pushed and made uncomfortable. Um, the next agreement is take responsibility. Um, so knowing that our words, our actions, um, what we put into this space impacts all of us. And so uh, whether our uh, words and uh, uh, behaviors have positive or negative or harmful uh, impacts, taking responsibility for whatever that is. The next courageous agreement is uh, its acronym, wait and wait. So wait is wait, why am I talking? So that probably means you're talking too much. And wait is wait, why am I not talking? So that means you can lean in a little more, share your thinking. Uh, we want to hear your brilliance and your presence. Next is lean into discomfort. There might be moments where you don't feel comfortable, uh, but through that discomfort might lead to a breakthrough or a new insight. And the last one is the modified Vegas rules. So basically, you know, uh, the saying what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, we're saying what happens, what is said here stays here, but the, the lessons can leave. So if we can commit to those, you can either shout out yes, or you can drop in the chat yes, or commit, um, and then we can go ahead and get started. All right, I think we're, go we're good to go. So we have three goals for our time together. Um, the first one is that we ground ourselves in some shared language. Um, the second goal is that we explore the relationship between um, power and system change. Um, and the third one is we plot, apply a racial equity lens, uh, a power lens and a system change lens to a real life design challenge that is happening in our community or in your communities in, in this case. All right, so uh, we did we did cut back an hour, so we're gonna see what we can get done here. Uh, we're gonna end at 4 p.m. Uh, no, 5 p.m. your time, 4 p.m. What time is it for you all? <laughs> it's it's one is it 1:22 for you all p.m. All right, so we're going to end I think at 4 p.m. your time, 5 p.m. my time. All right. But basically what I'm trying to say is we are now uh, one less hour because I know some quite a few of you have another meeting to go to. So we'll see what we get accomplished today. Um, but we'll start with some shared language and then 
transition to a case study and then the rest of the time will be all about you all. But before we do that, I want to ground us. Can we get a volunteer to read this quote out loud for us? I can. This, this is Ani. Okay. Uh, it's the grounding vision for Colorado, but nothing less than the most radical imagination will carry us beyond this place, beyond the mere struggle for survival to that lucid recognition of our possibilities, which will keep us impatient and unresigned to mere survival by Adrian Rich. Thank you. Um, so when we think about where we are in our country at this point, um, it's easy to get um, uh, to get burdened and weighted down and to feel so heavy by, by all of the things that we see that are harmful and traumatizing and dangerous. Um, however, uh, so much of what we can achieve uh, is activated by our ability to imagine and to believe in the possibility of a better future where we are all free and where justice is real. So uh, I would just ask that some of you all, if you feel so moved, to just drop in the chat uh, what is your vision for Colorado? What does a Colorado look, sound, and feel like um, uh, where disability justice is real and where um, who, what our identities are, um, are an asset, they are a gift, and they are a, mag a magical contribution to the state. So if you could just drop a vision statement uh, for me, and then I might ask a few of you all to share it out, out loud. What is that radical imagination look, sound, and feel like. Accessible Colorado. Thank you, Valerie. A place where everyone is able to thrive and people are unafraid to reach for dreams. All right, I might start calling on some folks. Let's see here. People get what they want, when they want it, when they need it, yes. Health, equity, and rural Colorado, thank you. Each person valued for their gifts and contribution. Inclusiveness, understanding, learning, and physical change. Rural education leading to rural jobs. People accept each other for who they are. Access comes naturally. Thank you, Kristen. All right. Um, where people with disabilities are gainfully employed. Uh, Kenneth, do you mind sharing, whole group? What, what does it look like, sound like, and feel like uh, where people with disabilities are gainfully employed? where um, we discover not only um, a key to success for employing disability, but to discover and untap the potential and the, the resource that disabled people are and that um, Colorado recognizes it first of all, first in that they are able to establish a gainful employment system for those people with disabilities, starting Thanks. with education. Thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate it. Uh, you said, uh, mentioned about uh, Colorado realizing the resource uh, that exists uh, in folks from the disability community. Um, okay, a few more here. Justice that is for all, not just the wealthy, eradicate disparities. Real communities that welcome everyone and real choices not determined by someone else. That sounds like power. Thank you, Linda. All right here. So let's start with some shared language. Um, racial equity, can we get a volunteer to read out the definition of racial equity? You can just shout it out. When you can no longer predict a person's life outcomes based on their race. Thank you. So that's exactly it, racial equity. We can't predict life outcomes based on their race. Um, so for when we talk about the word equity, um, it's not a feeling. Um, often we, we like to feel good about something, uh, which is important, but it's about outcomes. We should be able to measure 
is there a change in a person's life circumstances? So for example, um, we will know that health equity is true when we see uh, life outcomes uh, being more comparable. So that means that regardless of race or regardless of ability or disability, we are able to see that like one person isn't doesn't get to live to be 80 because they are a white male, able-bodied male, and another person doesn't live to be 65 because they are a black disabled woman. Um, so equity is about shifting outcomes and making sure that uh, there are no barriers to us realizing our fullest potential and living our best possible lives. All right, power. Can someone read uh, the definition of power for us? To be able, the ability to act. Now, you. you've crossed out one of these thingies. Yeah, thank you. I did cross it out because that's the power that we are not pursuing, at least not a we power. Uh, we often see or think about the dominant kind of power where it's power over, zero sum, one way. Um, I think we can think of some leaders <laughs> that represent that dominant power. Uh, instead, we are pursuing relational power, power with, it's steadily and increasing. Uh, it's not that I have to take your power um, in order for me to have power, but I can activate the power inside of myself um, and use that. Um, so when we talk about power, we see there being three sources. People uh, who are organized. Uh, so I, I imagine uh, in a world where we are powerful, all 30 of you all, once there's not, no longer a pandemic, are uh, at the Capitol together uh, fighting for a shared policy um, change that advances disability justice. Um, when we talk about uh, sources of power, that's position and status. So that means, uh, for example, we have more folks who are elected leaders, who are appointed leaders, who are in positions of influence, who are advancing uh, disability justice rights. Um, and they are working with those organized people who are right there at the Capitol. Um, and organized money. So that means money is getting organized, uh, philanthropic dollars, um, dollars out of our own pockets, uh, the dollars of organizations, uh, political dollars, campaign dollars are getting organized towards a shared vision. And so we're talking about these three sources working together towards a shared vision for power. Um, and here's an example. This is not an example that we power endorses, but it is an example of how organized people, position and status and organized money have led to very tangible policy changes. Um, so if we think about the NRA, the, nice, the National Rifle Association, they are organized people. They have 5 million members. Uh, when we think about the position and status, the NRA has uh, uh, in, influence to help get elected uh, over 330 uh, federal elected officials. Um, and when we think about organized money, they, uh, through their membership model, uh, have about 128 million per year that they are able to use towards their shared goal and vision of gun rights. Um, and again, I am not endorsing this. Um, demonstrate this with social change. All along the major street. Yes, yes. Thank you for that, Kristen. So we're gonna do a little more shared language and then uh, I'll do a case study and then we're gonna go into some breakouts. So systems change. Uh, can we get someone to read that definition of systems for us? A set of policies, processes, relationships, entities, and power structures, as well as deeply held values and norms. Thank you. So that, that is the system or systems. Uh, can someone read systems change? Fundamental change in policies, processes, relationships, and power structures, as well as deeply held values and norms. Shifting the conditions that are holding a problem in space. System Systems change takes time. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm going to repeat that last statement. Honestly, I need to hear probably more than you all. Systems change takes time. Wow, it does. 
man, this week was rough for me at work. I, I was like, can I find a trip to Jamaica? I uh, know this is a pandemic. I had to call some folks for some inspiration because it's it's been rough with this systems change work. Um, but all right, let me get back focused. <laughs> so yes, these are the definitions. A system is all the things. It's not just the policy or the law. It's not just the relationship. It's not just that person in a position of influence. It's all of that and how it works together. Um, and then the systems change is the process of changing those things. So changing the way that policies work, changing the relationships and changing the power dynamics and all of those things. Yes, it took 30 years to rescind Columbus Day. Systems change actually, that's a, thank you for lifting that up. Systems change actually takes about a generation. Um, and uh, uh, as a millennial, I think that that gets hard for me at times, realizing that I need to stay stay focused and stay the course and realize that I can't put, put something in a microwave and see it uh, come out uh, in a few minutes. <laughs> so systems change takes about a generation, 25 to 30 years. Um, and this is a framework that we look at a lot at WePower, and we got it from uh, a firm called FSG, and they have a really cool article that I think Julie shared with many of you called The Water of Systems Change. And so oftentimes, we, we only think about the surface piece, uh, and I think I'm one of those people who are the we. We think about the policies and laws, we think about the practices, we think about the money, where's the money coming from, who is it going to or not going to, uh, but there's also other pieces of system change, the relationships and connections, uh, the power dynamics, and then the most transformative level is the mental model. So what we believe, uh, what we say, impacts the relationships, impacts who has power, impacts the policies and laws and practices and resource flows. So these are the six conditions of systems change. And if we can start to understand these, um, in what ways are they, uh, these conditions holding a problem in place? In what way are these conditions uh, able to be used to shift a problem or shift a system? I think we can really get to a better world um, in so many ways. Uh, yes, we can, you will get a copy of these slides. Uh, Julie and Jose have them, and so I guess we could email them. But also on a break, I'll, sh I'll make sure I drop the link in here. So at WePower, um, this is what we are focused on. We are focused on building power, these three sources of power, organized people, organized money, position and status towards systems change, racially equitable systems change. So new mental models, new beliefs. Um, so for example, beliefs that uh, folks who are uh, disabled have our resources, our assets, our magical, our brilliant, deserve uh, access to jobs, deserve access to policies that do uh, more good and uh, don't do harm. Um, so we're focused on building power towards new new things, a new world where there's new policies and practices, new ways that money is used. Um, for sake of time, I won't talk too much about WePower. I'm going to skip these slides. Okay. All right. So we already talked about this, this visual, but uh, if you see the iceberg here, this is a great metaphor. Uh, we often just see what's on the surface when there's so much more below the water. And so what this model is talking about is that the surface is often that policy practice and resource, but we have to see what's underneath the water and what's below in order to really push things forward and to get transformational change um, that can impact our lives for good. So I'll talk a little, well actually for sake of uh, me not doing all the talking, maybe we can get someone to read uh, policies. Can someone shout out? We can just popcorn around. So if you can uh, read policies and then someone else can shout out and read uh, practices. So what are policies? Policies are rules, regulations, and priorities that guide institutional and individual actions. Thank you. Practices are organizational and practitioner activities that reflect their values and priorities. Thank you. Resource flows 
is how many people, knowledge, and information are allocated and distributed. Thank you. Relationships and connections. Quality of connections and communication occurring between system and players. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Power dynamics, which individuals and organizations hold decision-making power, authority, and influence? Yes, power. Last one, mental models. Thank you, Dory. Welcome. Deeply held beliefs and assumptions that influence one's actions. Thank you. So these are all the conditions of systems change. So we're going to start to unpack these. And back again, the, the mental model piece, the way the more that we can shift what we believe and what we what we the way we see the world, the more likely we are to shift the policies, the practices, and the re the resource flows. This is the most transformational level, uh, which is something, honestly, I often forget and I'm being more and more reminded of uh, every day. So I'm going to give a case study and then we'll finally get to these breakout groups. Um, so at WePower here in St. Louis, we were dealing with the reality that there's about 90,000 children birth through five who um, have access, who don't have access to early childhood education. Yet we know that early childhood education um, impacts a child uh, for, the, and for the rest of their life. What happens birth through five impacts their life 30 years from now. What happens birth through five actually impacts an entire city. And if we could solve for early child education, we could see a, a decrease in crime rates. We can see um, an increase in so many good things. So uh, here's a situation. Uh, we published something called the playbook, which is this roadmap for how early child education should work. And in just the first few months, 4,000 folks read it and 150 organizations and leaders uh, signed on. But we didn't just publish this playbook, we did deep listening to the parents, uh, to the early childhood education providers, to the folks who are impacted by the system, to ask them, what is your vision for early childhood education? Um, and what are the current barriers? And then from there, we said, all right, this is, this is your journey, this is your fight, uh, and this is, this is your right to fight for what is best for you and your family. And so we trained over uh, 200, uh, probably more than that now, uh, community members uh, on how to advocate for early childhood education change. Uh, and as a result, they have won so many amazing things. Uh, and it, it's just been an honor to watch them lead this work in St. Louis. Uh, so they uh, had a two week campaign where they won 7.5 million emergency funding for early childhood from the Federal CARES Act that came uh, down to St. Louis. Uh, and then they just won in November uh, a campaign where voters voted yes to um, having the first ever uh, public funding source for early child education in the history of St. Louis. So now uh, uh, millions of dollars will be uh, distributed to early child education centers every year uh, that serve low-income families. And so that will be starting to address some of the gaps that we know exist. And then there's also now a new coordinating nonprofit that exists to make sure that the system uh, is operating in a way that's best for families of color and families living in poverty. So um, the, the, the big question here is like, what exactly was the challenge that was holding the system in place? Uh, there were not enough uh, sustainable funding there was not enough, or there is still not enough sustainable funding to create high quality early childhood. Um, and we realize the challenge, but you also have to know what is our outcome? What is our vision and dream? And what are we, what are we reaching for? Back to that radical imagination. And the goal was uh, to ensure that there is enough early childhood education programs that meet the demand of these 90,000 families and they are high quality and cost effective. So there's, this is just a snapshot of the process. I'll skip some of that for sake of time. Um, I like this video. Uh, so we had a, an event um, where over 200 folks came. Uh, many of them were early childhood education providers, parents, early child education advocates. And um, as I mentioned, we developed this playbook for how early child education should work. Well, we didn't, again, we don't, just release things on our own. We wanna make sure that this is actually responsive to community. And so we had this big event where everyone who attended got to go around and vote on, is this a good solution? 
is this a bad solution? Is there a better solution? And so this community event helps shape, like what are the solutions that would or were not make it into the playbook for how to improve early childhood education? Uh, so this is just a group of the community advocates uh, who were uh, ending the day with uh, some celebration. All right, so that's just them saying all the power to all the children. Um, and I think we can replace that with as much as I love, uh, as much as I love children, it's all the power to all the people. Um, and that is um, every person, uh, disabled folks, folks of color, um, folks who are members of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, all the power to all the people is what we're about at WePower. Okay. So this is what you all are going to do. And uh, this is an example. You're going to think about uh, what is the design challenge that exists in your community? And then what is holding that uh, challenge in place? What policies are holding things in place? Uh, what practices, what resource flows, relationships and connections, all of those things. Um, so we are going to go into breakouts, but I, I'll give a few instructions and see if there's questions. Um, actually, I'm going to pause. Before we get into the breakouts, are there any questions, reactions, thoughts on all the stuff I just shared? Things that stand out for you all? I have a question. Sure. We represent social justice for a for 500,000 people with, di with significant disabilities in Colorado. How do you suggest that we break it down to one or two manageable um, challenges to work on? Because we can't yeah. work on everything that half million people need. Yeah. Well, one, that's a, um, a beautiful question. And that's actually going to be our next activity where you will all focus on choosing uh, one challenge in your group. Um, so we're going to, we'll do that in just a few minutes. Um, and I, I do have a, 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 some thoughts that I can share too. Uh, first off, 500,000, you all are, you all are, there's so much potential when we talk about organized people if you all can figure out a way to get clear on that one challenge and those 500,000 uh, folks demand uh, that the, the state do what you all need and want, you all can really do some amazing things. So uh, uh, I wish I, I could crack that code here in St. Louis. Um, thank you, Julie, for clarifying. Uh, still, still, still amazing. Um, so here's my thought. My thought is listen to the uh, disability community. Uh, you can develop a survey, uh, even pay some community members to uh, be leading the, the survey and listening and say, all right, if there's, um, uh, I don't know how many cities or states are represented by the coalition, but find, find someone in all of the cities that you're focused on and say, uh, all right, I need you to go out and have conversations with 500 people, um, pay them a, a stipend, give them a thousand dollar stipend and s have them survey disabled folks. Uh, what are the top five barriers for you in this, uh, in your home community? Um, and which one do we need to focus on and which one feels more, most urgent? And I think taking all that data across the state uh, from, oh, go ahead. Taking all that data from across the state and then saying, all right, what are the top five things we heard? And then saying, all right, based on the state uh, legislature, uh, which, which of these five makes sense to focus on for this year? What do we need to focus on for year two? What do we need to focus on for year three? So that's what we did. We did a survey. We had lots of meetings. And then from there, our community voted together on like, these are the top five barriers we wanna solve for. And then this is what we wanna solve for in 2021, 2022, and 2023, and 2024, and so on. So I think it's really listening and then using 
what you hear to, to be the decision for you all. I don't know if that answers your question or not, Don. Okay. Um, yes, a listening tour. Exactly. So what we're going to do is break into two groups. Um, the first group is going, well, both groups <laughs> um, are going to discuss what is, uh, and that should be uh, in the disability justice space, but what is the challenge uh, that you are cur currently experiencing or observing uh, in the disability justice space? Um, and is it negatively impacting the quality of life for folks of color as well? So we're thinking about the intersection between disability and race. Let me fix that. And the, this is Julie. I, I just wanted to add that the reason for that is that if you look at every, when we talked about equity, if you look at every single outcome, the data for people with disabilities of color is worse so like if you look at, for example, school to prison pipeline, who is that? Who's being affected? It's kids of color with disabilities. If you look at health equity, it's so that when you layer the two, you that's where the data is just really stark. Yep, exactly. Thank you for lifting that up, Julie. Um, we uh, have that much, do we have that much data? Because what I'm thinking is when I just begin to think about it, I think, okay, I've, I've done what I need to do with my life to be independent for me, but what would have happened if I were a person of color? And I keep thinking, I wouldn't be this far. But then again, here I am leading disability rights in Pueblo. We have no people of color on our committee. And I haven't the slightest idea how to go about advertising that because this is one thing that really is culturally different from group to group. Um, people who are Hispanic, for example, they keep their people with the family. Mm -hmm. um, they don't strive for independence like I do. You know, I want to be in my own place. That's not the way they think. It's, it's interdependence, so, which is what we strive for, which is what would be a better way. But let, let her finish the instructions. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I think that that is the discussion that I hope that you all have, Kristen. And I, I appreciate you modeling that for the rest of us. Um, so you're going to take, let's see here. You're going to take, I tried to write a new schedule here. Um, 15 minutes. And your goal in those 15 minutes is, tr is to try and, and this is an exercise. So this is not uh, to say you should go and do this. Uh, and make this a thing based on this 15 minute discussion in real life. But I would like for you and your group to decide what is that disability injustice uh, challenge that uh, you are currently experiencing and observing? And then ask, is this challenge negatively impacting the quality of life for folks of color? So you, we'll get a volunteer who can maybe take the notes in here and I'll drop the deck. And if you want, you can also just write the notes on a piece of paper and share them when we come back whole group. So then you'll, once you know the challenge statement, then you'll say, all right, what's the outcome? What is our vision for how this would be more equitable and just? So you're going to say, what do you hope to be true um, that improves things? So basically you could imagine Imagine life five years from now in Colorado. What will be different and how, uh, what will things look like in Colorado if we address this challenge? Any questions, anything? Does that make sense before you all go to break out? How do we break out? Yeah. <laughs> I think Julie has you all set up to go to breakout oh, rooms. So I will, I will click a button in a minute and um, and then you'll see something on your screen that'll say join. It'll be the group one or group two. And you just click it and you'll go there automatically. There's someone on here just with a phone. I don't know exactly how that'll work, but you're in group two. Um, and so um, so that, that's how it'll work. And then um, I'll give you a reminder when it's almost when you have like five minutes left and then when you have one minute left and then I'll just press something and you can either leave the room or come back or or if you don't you'll get put back um, automatically 
the breakout room will just end. You'll get a 60 second warning. Thank you, Julie. Um, so, all right, you will br uh, break out group one. You will take notes on slide 41 or you don't have to use a slide. It's up to you. Um, and then breakout group two, you will take notes on slide 45. So breakout group one will take notes on slide 41 and breakout group two will take, out, uh, take notes on slide 45. So the first question is, what is the design challenge you want to focus on either in your commu home community or the state? And then what is the outcome? If we solve this challenge, what will be different for uh, the disability community in Colorado? And to, so, get, to get the slides, just click on that link that's in the chat right now. Thank you, Julie. So it is 1.53 your time? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's 1.53 your time. We'll come back together at 2.0. We'll come back together at 2.10. 2.10, okay. Yeah, so you can have a little more time. Uh, so we will see you all at 2.10. Hi. Hi. I think we're all back, so I'll share my screen here. So how was it in your breakouts? How did it feel to go through that exercise? Anyone have any reflections? Well, I think um, like many groups, I think that are um, trying to change systems and change lives while doing it, it's always easier to throw out the problems <laughs> than the solutions. Yeah. It's very eye-opening to realize um, how much work we have to do and how much I don't know, maybe we'll cut off guard a little bit. I hate to think that, but I mean, it's maybe partially true. Yeah. Thank you. What about group one? Well, this, yeah, what about group one? How did it feel to go through this exercise? I don't know if um, other members of the group, this is Lauren Weinstock, are, came back, but um, one framed it, uh, our discussion as saying, we need to look at the picture of, that we're serving all bodies, all abilities, and not just look at it from the aspect of disability or race or all bodies. What do all bodies need? I had brought up housing and particularly in Denver, mm -hmm. but statewide, you know, the push for host homes, which whatever happened to self-determination and, and, you know, the person uh, having a choice. So she, rather than get into that, she suggested that we look at all people need housing, all people, want to work and and feel rewarded by what they get paid and what they can afford because of that. So I thought that was really helpful. I think group one really echoed what you were saying to um, Charlie about access to services and that maybe being the body politic, um, true choice being the population or our population, the disabled community. And then finances, as far as who's going to pay the bill or who's going to put finances or money or power behind what we need to have happen. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you all for sharing those reflections. So group one, can you talk us through? And then after this, we'll take a 10 minute break because I know we've been on for a little over an hour. But group one, can you talk us through your design challenge? And then uh, it's cut off right now. Let's see here. Talk us through your design challenge and your aspirational equity outcome. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, can I get a volunteer? from group one to talk us through your design challenge and the, um, the aspirational outcome. Go ahead, Sheila. All right, all right, well, we talked about 
uh, I, I'm the one who from Centennial and I guess I'm just dismayed at how disengaged my heart, my heart is where it needs to be, but my reality and my experience is not. And that's what I was trying to say as far as not having a lot of ra racial equity diversity in my community. Uh, we talked about um, <laughs> being mainstreamed, um, housing. We talked about, um, uh, we had one member who felt that many, many people who were in involved with people with um, disability had adults living with them in their homes. Um, and we talked about true choice and living where you want and um, getting a lot of pushback for that, struggling with fast ex access to services. And issues with finance, redlining, gratification, gentrification. Um, we were struggling really to put a put an idea as to how to define disability in in through the lens of um, racial equity as well. We talked about food deserts. Mm. You all talked about a lot. <laughs> yeah, we talked. We did talk a lot about a lot, and it's really hard to encapsulate it really to put it into a a yeah. sentence or two. Thank you. And then can you share what, what's the aspiration? What do you all want to be true? And what do you want to replace this cha these challenges with? I think we want to um, be able to make the choice and to have the choices available to make, if that makes any sense. Yeah, power. And to have the power to implement them. Yeah, this is a, a beautiful reflection uh, I said, look to the bottom of the inverted pyramid. Look how we see. Look at how we see disability. So we're really shifting our mental models and our mindsets to to see that all bodies are unique and essential and have needs and must be met. That's that's wonderful. Um, well, thank you all. When we come back from break, I'm going to push you all to choose one thing from this long paragraph of challenges. <laughs> but these are all really good challenges. So thank you for sharing. Um, okay, breakout two. Can you all share, I'm going to um, do a little formatting so it's a little easier for folks to see, but um, can you all share what your design challenge was and um, your outcome? I'm going to, let's see here. I'm trying to make it so we can all, folks who are able to can see this. Okay. I keep muting myself and start talking and suddenly realize, well, <laughs> that's not good. It was basically what happens to people in the justice system. And I've had some experience um, in that judges see disabilities in terms of, does this person have guardianship or not? Is he competent to function in court? They don't look at all the ADA definitions that we're used to. Mm. Um, which automatically puts us at a, at a disadvantage and then add race to that. And then it says case managers are not trained working with families also and what services they might be useful, you know. So, um, sorry about my phone. It just, anyway, it also... The bottom one is really important. People in mental health crisis, we'll send them to jail instead of to a mental health uh, environment. And if you're a person of color, well, <laughs> you won't get out of jail at all. So it's like somehow we have to move toward looking at people as people who may need support. Um, and need to be able to voice that. Um, and it has to apply to everybody. When we go into the court, I don't know how many people who are not disabled don't have the slightest idea what to do with themselves in court. So there has to be some kind of support system to help people deal with this system. And the system has to recognize 
that is not accessible to anybody. Everybody gets put in a box. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that reflection. Are you gonna say something different? Who are you talking to, Kristen? Everybody in my own group. Oh, oh okay. Because I just took over and, and uh, jabbered. We appreciate it. No, that was great. <laughs> so, um, so let's thank you, Kristen. Uh, and then the outcome, what are we, what are we hoping for? What will be different five years from now if we address some of these challenges? Everybody who walks into a courtroom will be treated the same way. <laughs> With respect, dignity, and support, respect, I suppose. Dignity and support. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, well, these are amazing reflections. We're going to uh, go to the next part of our exercise after a 10-minute break. So right now it's 2.20 your time. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So we will come back at 2.30 um, and we'll dive into the next part of our exercise. So see you all in 10 minutes. Is 10 minutes enough time? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, see you all in 10 minutes. Hey, I see some of us Great. back. Oh, a lot of us. There you are. Okay. Let me find my slide deck. There it is. I have resumed the recording. Thank you. All right. Well, it's good to see your beautiful faces again. Even if I can't see your face, it's good to be with you again after that break. Um, let's see. I need to make sure you all can see the right screen. Can you all see my screen? Okay. All right here. So, we, we started off with getting clear on what is our design challenge and our outcome? What are we trying to uh, reach for or aspire for? Um, so what we're gonna do is break back into groups, but first we're going to prioritize. So in group one, there are several very important design challenges named. One was not a lot of people with disabilities or racial diversity, mainstream cultural shock in college without people with disabilities, housing waiver services, limited to host uh, home, um, people with disabilities should have the ability to live where they want, um, struggling to access services, um, food deserts, um, uh, lack of employment. So um, those are some of the things group one named. It, group two. Oh, go ahead. So it sounded to me like some of those were like comments on the environment in some parts of the state and others were actually issues. Yes, I think you, you're right, Julie. Um, and then on this front, we had different challenge states, uh, challenge statements or design statements, design challenge statements as well. So what I'm gonna ask you all to do is uh, two things. So when you go back to your breakout, I'm gonna ask you to choose one thing that you're gonna focus on. So for example, is it a lack of employment opportunities for disabled people with disabilities? Um, is it a lack of uh, access to quality and uh, affordable housing uh, for folks uh, with disabilities? What is that one challenge that you all want to design for um, today in your group? So you're gonna take about five to 10 minutes to do that. And then you'll go to your next slide and you're gonna diagnose the, the system and the problem. Uh, so actually, we're gonna skip this slide because we don't have enough time. You're going I to- I have a question, I'm sorry to interrupt go ahead. you. Go ahead. Um, so I don't know if this is, this is a good time to ask, but I was the one taking the notes for that slide. And mm -hmm. I think the way, the reason it looks confused is we were mostly talking about housing, oh. but all of those things are connected to housing. Okay, okay. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I don't know if you were already breaking it down the issue or. 
I don't know what we're going to do next, but all of those things are connected to people not having the ability to choose housing, people having access to housing, all those things. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying, Jennifer. Sure. That a lot. So I think um, what I would ask is like a, maybe even put in bold what the design challenge is, which I'm seeing. I'm wondering if it's, um, I saw it, but then I lost it. Okay. Here, right here. So if this is a design challenge, just uh, in your group, make sure that you all are aligned on that. And then you're going to go to slide 43. And the question is, what, what is holding this problem in place? Does that make sense? And I'll actually borrow from here. So to what extent are these conditions holding the problem in place? How are these conditions holding the problem in place? So this part, oh wait, that's the wrong slide too. This part is called diagnosis. So we're gonna do some diagnosis first. And then once we have diagnosed the design challenge, then we'll start to talk about what actions can we take to address what we understand about the challenge. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about this? Let's see. I get it. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna repeat one more time. So you're gonna go to your breakout and make sure everyone's super clear on the design challenge, and then you're gonna say, how are these uh, current conditions holding the problem in place? So for example, um, this example talks about school discipline. So mental models are like our, what people believe and assume. So the reason school discipline is so bad and there's so much racial disparity is because the mental model people have is that administrators and teachers assume that certain students can't learn. Um, and then the power dynamic is that students have no voice in district decision making. And so they, their power isn't able to be used to influence what happens around school disciplinary issues. Relationships and connections, the parents and teachers don't get along. So that impacts the school discipline and the racial disparities. Resource flows, the grassroots advocacy organizations don't have the money to support parents and students with advocating for better discipline prop, uh, solutions. Then practices, teachers, um, I'm underprepared for diverse classrooms. So uh, I think like 80 or 90% of teachers are white women, um, but we know that um, uh, pretty soon a majority of public schools will be black and brown students. And so the teachers aren't prepared to navigate that. And then policies that are holding uh, the problem in place. School, send too many, uh, suspend, expel too many students of color. So you're gonna go through the same process for your design challenge around housing uh, injustice for people with disabilities. And then group two will do something similar. Uh, for ties. All right, make sense? Welcome back, Sonia. So it is three, um, okay, so we'll, uh, question, do we want to go to the same two breakouts or do we want to do even smaller breakouts? I want to go to the same one. Me too. I agree. Same I agree. One. Okay. Jose, is that cool if we, we go to the same breakouts we were in? I'll send folks to that same breakout. Sure. Okay, all right here. I'm gonna send you all, well, oh wait, I didn't give you a timestamp. So it's 3.30, oh, 2.38 your time. Uh, so you will have until 4.10 um, p.m. 3.10. No, 3.10, thank you. <laughs> it's 2.38, it's you all will have until 3.10, so you'll have 30 minutes to diagnose your design challenge. All right, here. Let's see. 
Um, Julie, am I still a host? Uh, Jose is the host. You should still be a co-host. Yeah, you're okay. the co-host, Charlie. You, okay. You have a uh, group control also. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I forgot how to do breakout rooms or what, but I'm trying. Oh, Jose, Jose's doing it. Okay. Um, so, Jose can do it whenever you whenever you say. Julie, can you send me the the, the groups? I just I, didn't write down. Oh no no, the, it should be there if you click. I, I don't have it anymore. If you click breakout groups, it, there should just be two groups already. I see it. Yeah, I didn't undo them. So. Okay, see you all at 3.10. Hey, everyone. I think this is everyone. Um, I hope you all had a good time uh, in your last breakout, really trying to diagnose. Um, so we'll do a quick share out um, and then we'll, we'll shift to taking action. Um, well, we'll take a quick break and then shift to taking action. So I'm going to share my screen in just a moment, but um, we'll start with group one. We'd just love to hear what, what was the design challenge and sort of what was your diagnosis of it? Um, and then we'll shift to group two and do the same. And then we'll take uh, one last 10 minute break. And then we'll uh, close out with a few, few closing reflections. Okay, here, let me hear my screen. All right, so group one, can you all recap quickly what your design challenge was and then can we have a volunteer talk through the diagnosis? I think if we put it in a sentence, we decided that we wanted accessible, affordable housing action in the form of development, as well as deploying what we have. Got it. Thank you. And did you all get a chance to talk through like the diagnosis? We had a rich conversation. <laughs> we really did. Okay. We talked a lot about, um, what is our notion of housing? This is mine and not yours. And where does that begin? And where does that end? Mm -hmm. And who has the right to this if this is mine and not yours? Uh, we talked That's about disabilities thing. being monolithic. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was someone else talking? Oh, no, I just said that's that mental model that we're holding in place. But I interrupted right. you, my apologies. Right, no, no. I, we, we talked about disability being monolithic and... Um, not recognizing that maybe what someone needs is just a separate space or a community responsibility. Um, how that we need to talk about this in a way that is not threatening. Uh, we went on to power dynamics and we talked about state legislature. We talked a lot about finance and um, where are the notes? Am I looking in the wrong place? I don't know. This, I had them. Here they are. Here they are. <laughs> Hi. Can you see this slide? Can you all see it? Mm -hmm. We can. Okay. Okay. Cool. Jennifer, can Sorry, you speak more directly wrong. to the notes? Yeah, I'm just. I got. I had problems logging in, and then. I'm all, I no, this it. is great. This is perfect. I, I didn't even, I skipped this slide for some reason. I apologize. No problem. Yeah, so sorry. I tried to, like, we didn't always um, talk about where to stick things, so I just tried to throw them in. Um, this is very thorough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they were really amazing ideas. So if I put them in the wrong place, I apologize. So basically... We talked about, I'll start with mental models because I think that's kind of where it was rooted in. Um, so we talked about the idea that that housing is for everyone. Um, the problem is rooted in that builders and policymakers assume that everybody has um, the same abilities and that's the problem with accessible housing. Um, that 
um, we can get tripped up on universal design if we try to make the same housing the same for everyone and that accessibility needs to be based on an individual's needs for themselves in their own home. Um, and that the change around mental models needs to be global and not just for people with disabilities. It needs to be that everybody has the right to housing that works for them, um, regardless if they have ability or not. And then it needs to be affordable for everybody. Um, we need to change our understanding of what it is to have housing in our communities, that it's a community responsibility, not just an individual property right. Um, and that it starts on our own block. Um, and a lot of these ideas were in a lot of different categories. So they kind of are interactive. Um, so the power dynamics include um, developers, the state legislature, um, it includes, it's kind of rooted in financial power. Mm. Um, one of the power dynamics is just having the ability to choose where you live and being able to access that. Um, and then we talked about one of the power dynamics is being able to field candidates for the legislature who are more in line with accessible and affordable housing, not just having relationships with them, but actually choosing them for ourselves. Um, relationships and connections are um, making connections with realtors, um, visiting schools, like, um, I don't know if they meant just individual schools or like, uh, maybe someone else could talk about that if they meant like design schools, um, developing relationships with the homeless community, um, Dory talked a lot about the Growth Management Act, and maybe she could talk more about that. Um, but it basically um, is like a 20 or is a, a legal issue that affects plans for 20 years. Um, man, uh, maintaining relationships with legislature, with legislators and city officials um, and the religious community. And uh, that was rooted in understanding community responsibility and then making it not just based on um, political issues, but understanding human value um, and working with nonprofits that may not be a traditional source of, um, of resources, but understanding that everything's interconnected and that we can build relationships in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. Am I taking too long or I missed the beginning no, you're of fine. this? So, okay. <laughs> Um, financial access is a resource flow and understanding how are we deploying housing that already exists in addition to building housing. Um, practices include um, withholding, we can, we can practice change by withholding buying, doing demonstrations, involving community voices and determining rules, regulations, and tenants' rights, talking about community versus socialism when going into deep social responsibility with help from the religious community and centric on common values and moral action. Um, some of the problems with policies are that they're currently bare minimum and we need to change rules around habitability, tenants' rights um, to modify their homes. Uh, we need to mandate involving community voice, work with city and states on growth management and building management. And that includes um, Dory's um, knowledge of the Growth Management Act um, and the involved disability voice um, and regulating um, with finding power for developers who don't um, follow the rules. Um, and she said that those state plans last 20 years. So it's really important that we participate in them and that we place affordability and accessibility front and center. Wow, you mm. all have the master plan. Sorry, was someone about to say something? Dory, I just wanted to to um, um, clarify the Growth Management Act. It's kind of a sub piece of at the federal level of um, infrastructure, and Washington State labeled it the Growth Management Act, but. Colorado has it split into three pieces, kind of the same thing. And it's at that apacolorado.org. And that act informs city plans called um, comprehensive plans. And those city plans that that Growth Management Act influences, um, those comprehensive plans last for 20 years. So that's why you get um, 
cities without sidewalks because in the 70s we built everything for cars and so does that make sense okay i just wanted to clarify yeah, that's helpful and very i'm learning so much by being in this session so thank you um so much um all right any any thoughts or reactions from group two that you want to share with group one um and also first can we just celebrate group one for your thorough work i'm a clapper you can snap cheer yell great work or drop something encouraging in the chat uh you all really wrestle with some big concepts uh but any thoughts for group one from group two i can throw something out real quick here in the five county region um we had some laws passed recently that any developer who wants to build an apartment complex has to have a certain percentage of uh, affordable housing uh, and uh, fully accessible apartments to go with. Uh, they either complied or they paid a big fine. But because this has become a mountain community nowadays, the developers found it a lot more profitable just to pay the fine rather than to build that affordable housing. Yeah. Well, thank you for lifting that up. Thank you. All right. Everything happens in Denver. It's not just a rural problem. Yeah, I've heard of that happening. Um, all right. Thank you for sharing that, Don and David. Um, okay, so we're going to transition to group two. I'd love to hear from you all. Uh, what was your diagnosis of, of your, well, one, first, what was your challenge? Our design challenge and second what was your diagnosis of the challenge i don't hear anyone else um i'm thankful to my group members to redefine the issue as the number of people with disabilities entering the criminal justice system um, rather than accessing necessary services. And the policies are around what happens to people with disabilities when they enter the both before and during entering the justice system. It's like, <laughs> They enter the justice system and there's nothing to support them. Um, and uh, teachers in schools often rely on zero tolerance policies. And then someone whose behavioral problem is associated with a disability gets bounced out for having a disability. And um, how do you tell the difference between disabled and disruptive when you have too many kids in the class? And there's, I've never understood suspensions in schools. If these students are having problems learning or they're having problems with disruptive behavior, what good does it do to suspend them from the one thing they should be learning? So anyway, <laughs> and a lot of these are just the, the, the practices. Um, people get expelled in school and they don't, they don't get to develop and change and grow. Um, and they're always separated from other people because of their disability. And I thought that had been taken care of, but I guess you don't have to have a separate classroom to be isolated. Um, and I think class sizes play a role in it. I think every educator for the last 50 years has said smaller class sizes are better. And we're still teaching 30, 35, 40 students in a class. Um, teachers don't get the funding they need to pay for skilled support. There's not enough support for special educators. That's an extra skill. Um, and so is substituting and being a parapro. That's not recognized. In fact, when I even thought about being a parapro, it's part time. Certainly isn't part time education. Um, 
there's an implicit bias uh, against disability and a an lack of understanding of what happens in their lives. And so that, that often happens across systems that people don't even start to think about what their life is out like when they leave whatever system they're in. And the power dynamics are that people get overwhelmed, they get burned out, um, schools fall back on, that's our policy, that's how we've done it. They don't want to put, um, they don't want to change the way they're doing things. And they, they don't, don't really acknowledge that anyone is unique. Um, it's like they don't have room to do that. And so they try to put people in a mold and it doesn't work. Um, and then it's someone else's problem. Yeah. Any, anybody else? All right, well, let's give some snaps, claps, cheers for, for group two for their very thorough diagnosis of, of, the, of the challenge. Guess I'm the only one full of cheer. <laughs> um, so we, you all have done some amazing work. You have um, one, named a design challenge, two, gotten clear on what is our aspiration and what is our vision. And then you started to do some diagnosis and group one even jumped to uh, loads of really amazing and equitable solutions. Uh, so I just want to say you all have accomplished a lot in our time together. Um, and for sake of time, I was hoping, uh, and maybe this can be activity that's a part two at another time or with your team and your respective cities, we were going to shift to taking action. So we understand the root causes of the challenges. Now, what are the solutions? And group one already started to do some of this as well. Um, so I hope that you all consider doing this as homework, uh, but we are going to take a five minute break and then come back for some closing reflections in a, in a video. So uh, it's three, is it 328? Yes. It's 328. Let's come back at uh, 335 and we'll do some closing reflection. Great. Thank you for checking. I'll resume the recording. Okay. All right, family, we're, um, we're almost done, but want to do some closing reflections together. Um, so one, thank you so much. I know that we've been uh, in quite the lengthy session and uh, it's been uh, pretty intense thinking about challenges and solutions and equity and our own experiences. Uh, so I would love for folks to, you can either drop in the chat or you can share a whole group uh, verbally. Um, but the first reflection question is, what did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about the disability justice space? So throughout this exercise, what did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about the disability justice space? So I'll wait a few minutes for folks to drop uh, thoughts in the chat and then I'll call on a few folks to share a whole group. What did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about the disability justice space through this exercise? All right, uh, I did some reflection on myself but I'll start reading out some of the things. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I Someone said, uh, I learned we have amazing, knowledgeable people and we can create our own solutions. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have so much more to learn. The disability justice space will always be a fight for those rights. And I learned that I love being the guy who fights for that. Thank you. I am capable of making change for people who are disabled. Yes. That we will need to be strategic and join our voices together to be successful. Absolutely. I said... I learned how much my privilege allows me to not have to consider the injustice of uh, people with disabilities face daily. Um, uh, someone learned also learned about them. Someone else learned about themselves a better appreciation for the lone game of systems change, disability space, more intersections and differences. Yes, I graduated from high school before there were any rights for us. I learned that we have a long way to go, and there are still people going through what I went through. 
a good reminder that there's always so much that we individually do not know and collective work is the best way forward. The Down syndrome community. For me, it was treating everyone equally. About the disability space, people with disabilities are criminalized, oh, I wrote that, <laughs> for simply being human and unique versus supported and valued. It's important for me to listen. I might learn something that is not part of my experience. The tagline, so to speak, is more alike than different. We're all humans. Would you go back and define disability justice space? Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, if I put criminal justice space somewhere, that was an accident. Um, I facilitated a similar workshop with Julie where I used that language, so I apologize for that. Um, but I was uh, really uh, leaning on the, the definition that I have seen uh, this coalition use, which is uh, cross di disability and uh, considering all the varied and different types of di disabilities. Uh, so I was using the word broadly when I say disability space. Um, I learned that I have more power and community involvement practices and potential partners within the disability space. Um, think more globally and realize that change takes time. Yes. Love the six conditions of systems change. Great reminders to think more globally. I learned that people need to continue becoming educated surrounding disability so that we can make a change for the better. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Does anyone want to share any, any other reflections out loud um, with the whole group? All right. Um, so this is kind of similar, but uh, if there's any takeaways, like what is one thing uh, that you're going to take away today? And also, if there's still questions you have, please drop those. I, I may not have the answers, but someone else may have the answers and you all can connect later on. So if you have any other takeaways or any other questions, please, please do share. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, play a video that I really uh, liked. And then uh, I would love to hear folks commit to one thing you're gonna do um, beyond today. Okay. So disability justice is a term that was coined by Patty Byrne and the Disability Justice Collective, which was this amazing crew of disabled, badass, mostly queer and trans people of color. Disability justice is really looking at creating a world where everybody, every mind, uh, regardless of how it's shaped or moves or functions in the world, um, has a place and understands that disabled folks have a lot, a lot, a lot to offer um, to our communities. And in the same vein, it's it's grounded in the agency and self-determination of a person who identifies, um, you know, like I identify as neurodivergent, um, that my agency and self-determination is prioritized uh, over, right, things like the medical industrial complex or saying that there's something wrong with me. Transformative justice is also about agency and self-determination, right? And people have understanding that we are all empowered um, to change our lives and to change behaviors and to transform the culture that we live in. Uh, disability justice is also trying to transform the culture that we live in to be, you know, bigger and allow for more agency and self-determination from more of us. So that intersection is a super sweet spot because, yeah, we're all fighting for that same thing, which is that we get to exist in the world without fear of harm just because of who we are or how we move through the world. As someone with, um, who's neurodivergent and with disabilities. Um, like a, a lot of how I entered into this work was through my own lived experience of trying to A, be accountable to my community and be able to show up for my community as someone who, you know, very frequently has to take moves back because of how my mind and my body function. Um, but also for care to become a collective thing. Disabled folks, you know, 
we've never been able to rely on uh, a lot of the systems that are in place or those systems have been incredibly harmful to us. More than 50% of people who are murdered by the police are people with neurodivergence or who are neuroatypical or have cognitive disabilities, right? So for a disabled community, this is also about us staying alive. I think everyone should have a safety team. Everyone should have a community that um, loves them enough and unconditionally. Having a safety team has enabled me to be outside, to be a part of my community. Um, and it also is a preventative tool. Uh, my friends know how to support me and take care of me so that I don't end up outside while I'm dissociated or episodic, which means I have less interactions with police officers, which means I have a less lesser chance of ending up back inside or really harmed by the state or the system. So when I think about transformative justice and community accountability, and again, that intersection, right, is like, this is really about um, going back to what we know is true, that our relationships are the most valuable resource that we have in, in maintaining our agency and self-determination, in getting the love and care and support we need to survive, and in shifting, right, shifting our culture kind of from the inside out. From a disability perspective, so many of us who are disabled like live in a lot of isolation because of ableism. So and I mean, that can happen for people who aren't disabled, too. I think that's true for a lot of survivors and a lot of people that they're like, what community? So I guess I also want to give a shout out because I think, you know, like community is a word in community accountability, right? And I think often there there is still this focus we have on like, oh my God, this great network of community is going to be there. And it's so wonderful. And a lot of us actually have a much more mixed experience or we're like, actually, we're loners, we're hermits, we're there's a lot of stuff that we don't actually have support around or we're actually kind of isolated. And I guess I kind of want to give a shout out to like people who might be watching this video who are living alone in their apartments or their lives, who are still building lives that have safety, peace, justice, and healing and to say that that's real too. Okay, well, um, thank you all for watching that video with me. Um, we can shout this out if possible. Um, but I would just love to hear from you all. What one thing do you pledge to do to shift the movement towards disability justice? What one thing do you pledge to do to shift the movement towards disability justice? You can just shout it out whenever you feel ready. I pledge to use that diagnosis tool in our work versus continuing to focus on the problem versus uh, breaking down where the problem has come from. Thank you. Since I'm the uh, community organizer, um, uh, I commit to continuing to support um, people to be involved. Thank you. I, uh, I would like to continue to do my best to create accessible technology accessible videos, accessible stuff, so that people with all types of disabilities can access information, not only at our organization's level, but at our community level. Thank you. Um, for me, Charlie, I, uh, I live in, I'm the one that lives in Canyon City. There's also another person on here through, from Canyon City. We have a website uh, here, and we started, I'm going to continue to be, speak my opinion and my piece of how to make a smaller community change their mind and how to make things more accommodating, accessible for people with disabilities in this town and to get, um, and to bring out the people with disabilities because I'm having a hard time reaching out to those people with disabilities here in Canyon. I know they're here. I just haven't been able to reach out to them through our website. I'm working on that. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Anyone else want to shout out their pledge? What one thing they pledge to do? And I see uh, Kristen Arielia. I don't know if I said your name correctly. Dory, David, and Lauren, 
shared some pledges in the chat. Um, so did Kristen just share one. Uh, anyone else want to share? Shout out what their pledge is beyond today. I pledge to continue to educate myself by asking other people their perspectives and listening to their lived experiences. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, there's this closing quote um, that I just love, love, love. So disability just. Sorry. So I'm going to close this out with this and then we will be free for the weekend. Um, Thank you, Luis, um, for your, your pledge. Um, all right. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty nil and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists, and in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Um, so that's it and that's my time. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited for the work that you all will do in Colorado and uh, the world you will imagine and the work that you will do to fight for that world that you imagine. And thank you for allowing me to be with you today. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Charlie. Uh, thank you. I hope I hope to see you, mo most of you the next time.